the lineups lined up for In It Together Festival this May, and it's crammed with three days and nights of music and more for the whole family. There's Anne Marie, The Coops, James, The Vamps, Groove Armada, James Bay, Jake Bug, UB40, Chasing Status, Careless, Mel C, Top Loader, Goldie Looking Chain, Diversity, Joy, Formidable, So Solid, Through Louise, DJ Sammy, Bjorn again, The Revtons, and. <gasps> well, far too many to fit in 30 seconds. But there's room for you! Book your tickets now at InItTogetherFestival.com. These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these. Are the other stories? <laughs> Volume 79 of the other stories is sponsored by the Scared to Death podcast. If you're looking for something scary, mysterious, and interesting to distract and entertain you, check out the horror podcast Scared to Death. Scared to Death podcast is nearing 150 episodes of demonic possession, hauntings, shadow people, black-eyed children, alien abductions, and so much more. Join Dan Cummins as he tries to scare his wife, Linz, each and every week with dark tales from around the world and around the web. Linz then gets that sweet revenge when she tells even more scary stories that have been submitted by fans. If you need more chills in your life, if you don't feel quite twitchy enough, it's time for Scared to Death. New episodes drop every Tuesday night, the stroke before midnight Pacific time. And it's available anywhere you listen to podcasts, and you can also watch the show on YouTube. So, get scared to death. Today's episode is Little Sponge, written by Lewis Carter and narrated by Josh Curran. Children are perfect mirrors, always watching, always listening, reflecting back that which they see within their parents. The school psychologist eyes me over her desk as I shuffle through my stock faces for an appropriate expression in response. I end up going with a mixture of curiosity and approval, which in hindsight probably just made me look constipated. You see what I'm getting at, don't you, Mr. Barnes? Please, call me Sam, I reply, opting for my stock, friendly face. Sam, she continues, I need to know you're taking this seriously, as I'm sure you're aware when a child starts behaving the way George has, it's often down to a change of circumstance at home. God knows I'm taking this seriously. My eight-year-old son had landed me face to face with the kind of person I'd spent my whole life trying to avoid. Honestly, nothing has changed at home. She breaks eye contact with me for the first time since I entered her lavender-scented office to consult her notebook. A notebook which I realise with a sickening sense of dread contains information about me. You're still working from home? I nod. Telemarketing. I once googled the top ten jobs that sociopaths are attracted to, and was surprised not to find telemarketer on the list amongst the usual suspects. Not all sociopaths need to inflict harm or unease through physical means. I've always found that I can get by quite happily exploiting people from the other end of a phone a few times a week. That way, I can keep myself to myself when I'm out in the real world. For the most part, that is. In that case, I imagine you spend a lot of time around your son whenever he's not at school? Yes, I concede. I'd been dreading this line of questioning ever since I found blood under George's nails. The call from the school's child psychologist came a week later. Apparently, George has been coercing his classmates into doing small favours for him, swapping lunches, giving him the best toys at break time, that sort of thing. To make matters worse, Treacle, the missing class hamster, turned up shortly after George's actions had been discovered. Treacle's eyes had been gouged out, and a yellow pipe cleaner from the arts and crafts supply wrapped around its neck. Nobody had accused George outright, 
but amongst whispering parents, there was a consensus that George was suspect number one. George hasn't witnessed any kind of negative behaviour that he could be mirroring at school, does being raised by a single father that just so happens to, technically, on paper, be a serial killer count? No, absolutely not, I reply. I should have seen this coming, prepared for it. The truth is, I didn't expect this kind of thing to develop in George, at least not at such a young age. I must have been around ten before I began to realise that something about me was different. Like George, I found it hard to understand the volatile concoction of emotions that seemed to gurgle and rise to the surface inside of normal people. I used to spend hours looking at my reflection, trying to mimic facial expressions. The faint curling of the upper lip as the postman handed over a package too large for the letterbox. The eyebrow furrow and lip bite my mother received when buying ground meat from the butcher. I didn't know what these facial cues meant. All I knew was that people became agitated when I didn't return them. So I practiced, alone, night after night, in my mother's floor-to-ceiling mirror in her bedroom. She loved that mirror, until I saw her reflected in it, sprawled over the same butcher that sold us ground beef. He was making a different facial expression to the one he usually wore. His fingers were tinged pink from a poor attempt at scrubbing away the raw meat sinew. He smelled of dry herbs and sweat. She sold the mirror soon after. If my mother knew what I was, she never let on, even when the butcher went missing. What about your own upbringing, Sam? Jesus, this is a fucking nightmare. Uh, Pretty uneventful, I reply. My hands begin to sweat. The last person to make my hands sweat was a bald man at my local corner shop. He bumped into me while I was reaching for a pack of spaghetti. The impact caused him to spill some of his groceries. How about learn to fucking walk? He'd shouted. Before I knew it, I was letting myself into his house through a back window. He was found, three weeks later, wrapped in a bin liner. Fifty-seven puncture wounds to his chest alone. Look, I know George has been a little rough of late, but I can assure you that he's going to have a very stern talking to. No offence, Mr. Barnes, but I'm not sure you understand the potential gravity of the situation if you think a ticking off is the answer to George's behaviour. Shit, 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 shit. I'm making it worse, drawing more attention instead of deflecting. I think it's perhaps time we brought... George in on this conversation, don't you? No, nope. Terrible idea. Good idea. George, could you come in here, please? I close my eyes as the office door creaks on its hinges. When I open them, my son is looking up at me with his own glassy black eyes. I remember the first time I looked into those eyes. Seems like to this day, George has been the only one I haven't been able to fool. Seems like to this day, he's never stopped looking back. George, you know why I've asked your father to come in here after school today? He makes a forward motion with his head, sizing her up. For the next thirty minutes, she talks about behavioural patterns, asking me more questions, writing more notes. As her pen flicks over the page, I imagine words like borderline, antisocial, manipulative, dangerous. Then I imagine ramming the pen into her carotid artery. My palms are drenched. When we're finally free to leave, she smiles at George, moves to place an arm on his shoulder. His eyes flick up to meet hers for the first time. A warning flashes across them, a promise of violence. 
Then he smiles and exits the office. Fuck. Maybe she didn't notice. In the car park, I suck in a lungful of air while trying to assess the damage. George tucks a hand under his shirt, coming away with a small notebook. Her notebook. That settles it, then. (sighs) Which car is hers? I sigh. George raises a small finger. I follow its trajectory towards a blue four-door Fiesta. Sensible, amenable, unremarkable. If only its owner had similar characteristics. I wait for the car park camera to crane its neck away from the car. Stay here, I say, as I make a beeline for the Fiesta, penknife already in hand. I wedge open the bonnet, my hand sinks inside the guts of the engine. An air freshener in the form of a friendly gecko smiles at me from the dashboard. Fifteen minutes later, I pull my own car over along the only road out of town. I let out a resigned sigh and turn to my son. Are there any other treacle incidents I should be aware of? He shakes his head. I don't just mean at school. What about the neighbours? He turns his gaze to the road ahead. I open my mouth to tell him that I need to know to protect him, not to punish him. But before the words can form, the blue fiesta enters my rearview mirror. I instinctively slouch down in the driver's seat and wait for the fiesta to pass. It takes me a few moments to realize that George has copied me in the passenger seat. The therapist's words flash across my mind. Children are perfect mirrors. We trail the fiesta the few miles it takes for the town to bleed away into countryside. The fiesta's right blinker winks at us before pulling over into an embankment. Perfect timing. I level the car alongside the fiesta, blocking it from the road. When I wind my window down, she's already out of the car, kicking the tires, phone in her hand, too flustered to realize I've pulled alongside her. I do my best not to sound like some B movie creeper. Uh, car trouble? Her head meerkats over the roof of her car. Sam? Uh, What are you doing here? I shuffle through my stock expressions before landing on reassuring as I step outside. I thought we'd take the scenic route back home after our chat. Give George some time to think about your kind advice. I turn to George through the open window. Stay in the car. I take a step closer to the Fiesta. She grips her phone tighter. Need a hand? Her eyes flit up and down the secluded road. That's okay. I've got roadside assistance. She unlocks her phone, begins to scroll. Don't be silly. Pop the lid. Might be able to save you the hassle of a tow. The conflict is written across her face. She knows she should play it safe, insist on calling for help. But she also knows she's being paranoid, and worse... Rude. I'm not sure. Probably just a loose spark plug. No need to hassle an engineer. Please, it's the least I can do after your help. Uh, Sure. Thanks. She pockets her phone and leans inside the passenger side door to release the bonnet. As her head dips inside, I peer into my own car. Shit. Where is George? Let's take a look then. I lift the bonnet as she joins me at the front of the car, making sure to keep her distance. Yep, just as I thought. There's your problem. She can't help herself. As she leans into the engine, I step back. I feel for my penknife. Where the fuck is it? Sam, uh, what am I looking for here? Her head is still inside the engine. I'm losing my window of opportunity. Penknife or no penknife, I need to act now. I squat. My fingers wrap around the lace of my right shoe. The lace I keep loose for this very contingency. I'm behind her in a second. 
my fingers coiling around my makeshift garrote just as she's beginning to turn around. I don't see... I wrap the lace around her neck just before she manages to pivot her body. Her shoulder burrows into my sternum as panic kicks in. A slither of a cry escapes her fast contracting throat. I bury my knee into the small of her back. We fall forward over the open engine. Her cries turn to splutters. This is far more intimate than I was hoping for. The lace begins to slip through my hands. Shit, sweaty palms. The lace loosens around her neck. A hoarse scream dulls my focus. Her newfound slack allows her to swing her head back into my face. Something in my nose snaps. The lace slips further. Exhausted and dazed, we both jostle to keep our footing. Her head dips, winding up for another backwards headbutt. My grip loosens further as the lactic acid causes my biceps to scream out in pain. The friendly gecko grins at me from the dashboard. That's when I see a small hand reach out from behind the car. A hand holding my penknife. With the swift precision of a surgeon, George severs the left ankle tendon of his school psychologist. Her weight crumbles beneath me, her head connecting hard with a front bumper as we slump to the ground. I allow myself a single breath before flipping onto her stomach and wrapping my hands around her throat. She watches George emerge from beneath the car before returning her gaze to me, pleading with everything but her voice. I squeeze harder, realizing that if I was normal, this is where the oxytocin would flood my brain, filling me with empathy for my victim. But I'm not normal. I've never been normal. Instead, all I can offer her is a small parting concession. <laughs> Kids, right? We load her body into our boot, tossing her notebook in after. Inside the car, I hold my hand out for the knife. He looks at me as if I'm taking away a merit badge he's earned by assisting in his first homicide. I told you to stay in the car. He hands the knife over with a huff. As we drive off, I notice him pulling faces in the wing mirror, mimicking the expressions the psychologist made before she died. Expressions he has no more comprehension of than I do, but expressions, like me, he will learn to mimic, to exploit, like the little sponge that he is. I know I should feel guilt, remorse, disgust, a whole cocktail of complex emotions. Instead, I make a mental note to buy bin liner. I guess it's true what they say. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, not when its core is as rotten as mine. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. Little Sponge is written by Lewis Carter, narrated by Josh Curran, edited by Carl Hughes, with music by Briley, Christopher Oxley and Tom Robson, and sound effects provided by Freesound. Org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Karen O'Brien for helping with our submission reading. And of course to Captain Ben Arrington for the social media bombs he drops from his content fighter plane. Lewis Carter is an award-winning writer and filmmaker from South Wales. More of his work can be found by searching Lewis Carter Writer online. For all inquiries, please contact lw.carter at hotmail.com. Josh Curran is a narrator and writer. He's narrated many episodes of The Other Stories over the show's lifetime. He's also the creator of the horror audio drama podcast, Miscreation. You can follow him on Twitter at, at jcurranwriter. Again, today's episode has been sponsored by Scared to Death. If you're looking for something scary, mysterious, and interesting to distract and entertain you, check out the horror podcast, Scared to Death. New episodes drop every Tuesday night, the stroke before midnight Pacific time, and it's available anywhere you listen to podcasts, and you can also watch the show on YouTube. So, get scared to death. The Other Stories is a production of the Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver, 
and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means share the hell out of it. Until next time. The lineups lined up for In It Together Festival this May, and it's crammed with three days and nights of music and more for the whole family. There's Anne Marie, The Kooks, James, The Vamps, Groove Armada, James Bay, Jake Bug, UB40, Chasing Status, Careless, Mel C, Top Loader, Goldie Looking Chain, Diversity, Joy, Formidable, So Solid, Crew, Louise, DJ Sammy, Bjorn again, The Revtons, and. <gasps> well, far too many to fit in 30 seconds. But there's room for you! Book your tickets now at InItTogetherFestival.com.